All right. Hey, everybody. Um, we kind of told you we were going to do this, but basically Matt and I have decided that we'd like to do some sort of code review where we go over somebody's code that was submitted to us. And the idea here is more just to be educational. Um, we're not trying to do a complete code review where we refactor everything or anything like that. Um, the goal is to help people see different patterns and techniques they can use in their code and things that might make it more testable or easier to maintain. And we wanted to use real code. Um, I will add the caveat here that a lot of people submitted code for us to look at, and a lot of it was great code, but it's large enough that it would have been really hard for us to jump into it with the limited time window we have. So we're going to start with something that's a little bit smaller. Um, it's probably still a little bigger than is ideal, but uh, I think it's small enough that we can jump through everything. So I'm assuming everybody knows who we are, but just in case, uh, Matt, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, so hey everyone, I'm Matt. Um, I'm an engineering manager at Cloudflare um, most of the time, and then the rest of the time I'm on Twitter posting about Go, um, and just uh, I have a Twitter community for Go as well. I spend tons of time doing stuff like that, so uh, nice to be here. I think this will be, this will be fun. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're not sure how this recording is going to go, so bear with <laughs> us. Uh, Matt is recording on Zoom. Um, I'm also recording my screen locally, so we have different options to work from depending on how this goes. Uh, Matt, do you want to, in Zoom, pull up the code so we can look at that? Yeah, let's share my, let me figure out how to share my screen. and see like such a boomer at the moment because I actually don't know how to use Zoom very well. I usually use other stuff. Um, I'm just as bad, so. <laughs> here we go. Share screen. So let's start over here. Can you see the, can you see the code now? The GitHub? Yes. And I'm going to see if I can. I hate how Zoom decides it's going to demand full screen whenever somebody shares. <laughs> So I was really, I was really glad when you suggested this repo, John, because um, I think a lot, a lot of the code that we had submitted was uh, either APIs or small CLIs or some libraries that were incredibly niche. And to be honest, John and I weren't even entirely sure we were, uh, we were the right people to comment on them because they were they doing some really impressive stuff. But this one's cool. It's a game um, which I haven't seen many people write in in Go. I, I tend to see a lot of APIs and system level things, and so it was really fun to see something a little bit different. And um, it took me back to college a little bit. I remember writing a very similar game to this, like the Snake Style game in in college. So this was like a lot of fun to look through, and I uh, I saw Go used in a really interesting and different way. So I've seen it before, so it, it's a really good one to have seen. Yeah. Um, do we want to go ahead and run it? Yeah. I don't know how sure. easy it is for you to share that. Yeah. All right. Perfect. I can see that. Cool. So this is the game. So press enter to start from the beginning. Let's do it. Press enter to start. And you kind of got these. Everyone knows how to play a snake game, right? So you, uh, we've got emojis for our snake. And I'm pressing left, right, up, down on the keyboard to try and uh, collect the, the emojis which get added to the to the back of my uh, snake. Uh, we're playing the original version. It seems where if you touch the edge, you don't scroll and come back around the other side. So that would be a that'd be a pretty cool feature to try and add. But it all seems to work pretty well. Like you can press R to restart and it'll start again. I'm just going to crash into the side again um, because it also has this feature where you can press L to save in the last save level. Um, I'm not sure I figured out how to save progress when I was playing it, around with it. Did, did you figure that out? It does save on its own, but you have to actually like beat a level. So if you go to the progress.txt <laughs> file... So um, that was John. I, I messed around with the code. Terrible mistake. <laughs> All right. So if you just want to tab back to your editor real quick, what you can do is go to progress.txt and you can replace that with like one or two. We've only just been doing sure this a few edit. seconds and uh, John's already doing dirty hacks to like cheat. Well, I'm not trying to be <laughs> terrible. If I, but... if I couldn't be level zero, I don't have much chance of me being able to do level two. It's really not much. It's just a little bit faster. I'm assuming... Seems to oh, not working too well. Well, your editor added a new line to the end of that file, and that's one of the things that this code does not like, I've noticed. So you can't have a new line at the end of it. Um, you can fix that if you want to see what it looks like with that. Although, maybe nice. it worked. Or did you revert that? I reverted it, yeah. Okay. So, so if you want to... If we wanted to fix that, we could. Um, I mean, truthfully, I don't, I don't know if I'd call that a bug, given that um, this is something that only people who are cheating would see. So um, <laughs> not really a bug in that sense. But uh, it's in, I think it's in main.go. There's some code to load the level. And basically, it reads the entire file in, and you essentially just have to trim the, the string that it gets back. 
so that it's you know doesn't have any extra new lines or anything in it. Yeah, here we go. No progress. Makes sense. That's cool. Yeah, but I think um, it's a good thing to call out, right? Like when using reasonably, this probably works well because the the design of this was intended for computers to read and write to that file and didn't expect me to come in and cheat because I'm so terrible at it. So I think those situations where you, you you could solve for it and it's very good defensive programming, but whether we whether we need to, to do that for everything, uh, as you say, especially with the, the context of it being a, a side project, I think it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so do you want to jump into the code um, or I can go through the code if you want and just sort of give an overview of sort of what how the code works? Yeah, let's do that. That sounds great. All right, so... Basically, this main function, or the, sorry, this main.go file has a ton of global variables, and this sets up pretty much all of the game state. It has um, some of the graphic stuff for rendering the game. And if we scroll down here to the main function, you'll see that there's, um, if we get down here to the game logic function that it declares, uh, you just scrolled past it, but oh, my bad. right there on like line 104, yes. um, there's a function declared here that this is going to control all the game logic. So every time that it needs to decide um, if it's going to show the game or if it's going to show the start screen or anything else, that's all inside of this massive function that uh, is basically just a big switch case, um, depending on which state we're in. So if we're at a pause screen, if we are actually playing the level or if we're at a game over state, it's going to go through all of that. And so this closure is created. And then there's also another function down here on line 222 that's called key input callback. And this is the function that they're using whenever a key press gets made. So anytime the user presses like A, S, D, or W, or left, right, up, down, you know, arrow keys to change the direction of the snake, this function is going to basically decide what it's going to do. And you can see looking at the code that there's a bunch of if statements that um, you know are, are fairly complex because it has to figure out um, what keys are being pressed but it also sometimes has to check what state are we in at the game, um, for instance. So if we're playing the actual game, then pressing ASD and W can move the snake around. But if you're not on that screen, then it might want to do something different. So those two functions, the way they're used is inside of, I believe it's graphics.go. There's a function called func main loop on 263. And this main loop is, is basically what drives the entire game from what I've looked at with the code. So this is just an infinite for loop that checks the window and it does a couple things related to rendering the graphics. It calls the game logic function, which is that one that was defined inside of main. It's passed into this as a you know, closure. And then um, it eventually calls GF, glfw.pull events, which I believe is what causes the, um, the key, put, key input callback function to get called. So they, they end up registering that key input function that you know is a callback for registering those events um, inside of the main function. And then I believe when this poll events gets called is, is whenever it looks for those events and then would call that function if there was an event of some sort. Um, I haven't looked too closely into the OpenGL code to see for sure that that's what's going on, but that seems to make sense. Um, I, you know, Matt and I should probably have the caveat of neither of us have used these OpenGL packages ever. So um, we're very unfamiliar with that code. Yeah. And what you said makes a bit more sense now as well, because I, I noticed in um, when I was looking at main.go, it had this function that I'd never seen before. Let me scroll to the top real quick. But there was uh, this function here, this runtime.lockOS thread. And I, I was a little unsure why that was being used, to be honest. Um, I looked into it, and it does kind of what you'd expect. It kind of uh, ensures that everything's called on the main thread. But now we've just dug through that OpenGL code. It makes a bit more sense, because this poll events function here actually calls out explicitly this function um, may not be called from a callback, and this function may only be called from the main thread. So that's really interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll probably experiment later to see what happens if you don't do that, because I'd be interested to see what happens if you do if you do call on something else. Maybe it's just unpredictable. Yeah, I was going to say, I haven't messed with it. Um, I would assume that that's something that the OpenGL package suggests they do, but again, I don't know. Um, okay. So that's just one of the odd things you get into when you're you know, dealing with graphics and that sort of stuff. Yeah. So... Um, that, that kind of gives you a rough idea of what this code is doing without going through all the logic. We're going to go ahead and link to the package. So if you want to jump into it and look at the code more you know, more detail, you can. Um, 
there is a helpers package that has a couple different functions that are basically just there to help do a couple things that both the graphics and the main package need. Um, for instance, they're used to load the images that we see. So like the smiley face or the backgrounds for the levels, that sort of thing, um, are all loaded with this load image function. Um, we don't really need to go into detail as to what all those are. They were just sort of pulled aside and we can talk about, you know, that or anything that we might change or suggest if, if we were doing a code review when we get there. So where would you want to start, Matt, if you were doing a code review? Yeah, I was going to ask you the same question. So before, so you've done a really good overview of the code there, and this that which you've actually gone into way more detail than I did. Um, and this is code you'd never seen before, right? So what what was your process for figuring out how this works? Did you start in main.go and dig through it? Did you look look through the repo from GitHub? Like, how, what's your approach to kind of figuring out a code base that you've never seen before? Well, this one was a little bit different because we wanted to, like, I knew we wanted to code review it, so I was coming into it looking like, is this too complex? So the first thing I did was just very quickly expand all the folders and just get a rough idea of like how much code is there? Because when somebody sends you a package that has a hundred Go files, it's pretty clear that that's probably not going to fit into like an hour long session of a code review. Um, so then once I saw that it wasn't too much, I was like, all right, there's not a ton here. So we can kind of get a feel for what's going on. And yeah, I always start with the main.go. I look for the main function and I kind of just try to get a sense of like what is happening here? Like what is it calling? And which ones, you know, which of these like little calls do I want to follow to sort of see what's going on? Um, I, I'm guessing this is just one of those things that comes with experience. When you see some of these functions where they call like set key input callback or something uh, on line 78, I think it's fair to look at those and be like, okay, I'm guessing this is calling something to register, you know, key key presses. Um, you know, so there's some functions like that that I didn't even go into at first because I was like, I probably that's not really dictating like when the game gets rendered or anything like that. Um, and you can see here the game logic function, since it is inside of the main function as a closure, um, I don't think it would have to be because they have so many global variables at this point, but it is there. So you see it very quickly and you kind of get a sense for what the game logic is. And then you can see that they call that, uh, the graphics dot main loop there at the very end of main. And that seems to be, you know, where the code just sits the rest of the time. So yeah, I, I basically started with main then just started following some of those functions to see where they went. And there's a lot of other functions here that I I honestly haven't looked at at all. I just followed a rough idea to see what the code was doing because I wanted like an overall view of what was going on, not not like the detailed getting into all of that. Um, but I will say that I think Matt and I both noticed the same thing. Whenever we looked at this main function or this main.go source file, the first thing we noticed is that there's a lot of global variables. And when you get down to that game logic function, you'll notice that a lot of those global variables um, I think the reason that they're put there is because the key callback function and the main function both need access to all these global variables. So this was the easiest way, I guess, for them when they were learning and figuring this out, because it is worth adding the context that this package wasn't, you know, it wasn't some project that was meant to be shared with the whole world necessarily. It was somebody learning Go and figuring things out and experimenting. So it's it's good to have that context in, in mind. It's not like a professional developer writing software they're planning to release. Um, but yeah, so there's all these globals, and I'm guessing they did it because it seemed like the easiest way to make that stuff available in the callback function and inside of the main function. So I think if we were doing a code review and like asking for refactors, I think that's probably where I would start first. So Matt, you had actually mentioned um, before we started recording, one of the ways that you would do this. Do you want to share about that? Yeah, so I think one of the, uh, I, I guess, firstly, before we get into that, do we want to talk a little bit about the problem with globals and some of the issues that they can cause? Because I guess, you know, at a high level looking at this, it seems pretty reasonable. They're pretty well named, right? Like, it was very helpful to see a lot of the really key um, components, the, the things that we were going to care about for this game, like were declared up front. So like, as I was uh, flicking through this, like seeing window, window width, window height, like that makes a lot of sense to me in a game. Like, I understand why it's there. Then I start, and, and to be clear, I actually think they're reasonable things to have as globals. And I guess I can talk a little bit about that in a second. But when I saw these, when I saw these things, this is what the game over, show level, reset level, low level. That's when I was like, hmm, I wonder if these should be should be globals or whether these feel like they belong to game state, right? Like the game started, so game over is false. And should we show a level? Maybe it sounds like we should be able to see one level at once, and maybe it's um it's it's almost a, it's like ephemeral almost like it, it's true at one point in time but it doesn't need to be sort of um how do i describe this well 
they just don't need to be global, I guess, is the is a simple way to think about it. They don't need to be global, so it's probably a good idea that they're not. So one of the things that I would typically recommend as something to refactor here is we could de define something like a, a struct, which is a game. And that game struct might have some state around it, like uh, maybe it would be something like uh, in play, and maybe that would be a ball. And uh, maybe we could even have like an array of levels cleared that we could use for various information. Maybe we could have a player's name when we show it on the leaderboard later. And the really nice thing about this is as we sort of navigate through creating uh, the game, if we want to uh, start a new game, we could just like, we can basically either reset this game struct or we can make a new game struct. And it makes, and then we could potentially even have a, a history of games played that were all represented as their own struct, um, which I think is quite a powerful way to represent this. Um, and it would also help with something else we'll probably discuss a little bit further on with uh, testability. We'd be able to create uh, instances of our game in a certain certain place. So maybe maybe we someone discovered a bug, a level two, if you do this specific thing. And right now with this global configuration, maybe we could get it into that sort of state, but it would involve like sort of making changes to globals. And then if we were doing that in a test and something else was also listening on that global, maybe we change something we didn't mean to to try and configure that environment. Whereas if we've got this struct which houses everything about our game, I feel like it'd be pretty easy to make a uh, a fake game in a specific situation that we could be able to like interrogate and set up in certain configurations to see, uh, you know, to basically to recreate that bug and then make sure that we we could fix it. Yeah, um, especially the testing is especially like a good point, uh, or even resetting the game, because when I saw all these globals, one of the things that worried me was if the game gets more complex and somebody wants to reset and you forget to change a variable back to what it needs to be at the default state, you know, the more global variables you have, the more things that need to get set back to some default state to start with. So if you have a struct that has a way of just initializing everything the way it's supposed to be, that's great. Um, and you technically could write a function that is meant to initialize everything and hopefully you get it all right. But having a struct just tends to be a lot simpler. Um, and then you were talking about bugs. Um, there actually is a bug in this game that I noticed, which was whenever the snake is going, let's say it's going right, the way the controls are supposed to work is that you can't press left as your next direction because you would immediately go back into your tail and that's just not a valid direction. So you can go up, down, or continue going right. Um, but the way the code is actually written, it does the check of what is the current direction and is the new direction the opposite of that. So one of the ways you can bypass that and cause a bug is if you press up to change the direction to up, but then before the next like tick of the screen happens, you press left, it then compares left to the up direction so now all of a sudden your snake moves backwards into itself and dies instantly. So <laughs> if you were trying to write a test to make sure that didn't happen again, um, you know, with the code we have here, it'd be a little bit tricky to get that state correct. And then if you did get it correct, you'd have to make sure that you reset everything for your next test to run, um, you know, so it has a clean slate to work from. Whereas if you had a game struct of some sort, you could pretty easily take that game struct, set it up the way you wanted it, run your test really quickly, and then the next test could set up its own game struct in whatever state it needs. That's awesome. It's, it's really cool you spotted a, a bug by playing around with it. Um, I, I definitely didn't spot that. I, it was the first time it happened. I just thought, oh, maybe I just was bad or something. <laughs> um, but then I like I quickly went back and was messing around with it to figure out um, what was going on. And I was also digging into the logic a little bit for like the actual snake game to figure out where it was in this code, but also just like how it was written. Um, because I guess it. So you were talking about creating a game state. I think if I was doing a review, one of the things I'd potentially do to take that even farther is that uh, we, we talked about testing. So ideally, you'd want to have some tests here if you were trying to like release this as a, a real game or you know, you're trying to maintain it long term. Tests would help. Even if you don't have a ton of them, just a couple to test some, some major issues. <clears throat> um, but right now, the way the code is written, it's kind of hard to test because the, the GUI stuff and the actual game logic are so baked together that there's no real separation. There's no way of actually checking the game state really easily without looking at the variables, which means that any test you write has to have access to all those variables. Um, they're currently globals, so as long as you were inside of the main package for your test, I guess you could do it, um, but that seems like it would be annoying to make work um, if you were trying to. So the other thing that I would probably suggest if, if this was something that I was writing you know, to, to maintain it and go long term with is that I would take all the logic for the snake game and I would probably try to extract it into its own isolated type or package or something um, where it's just the snake game and it doesn't have any graphical representation. It's just some sort of package that has 
uh, you know, some commands you can send to it that maybe has it progress the game state. And it would look very similar to the game state that Matt was talking about, except it would be a little bit more specific in the sense that it would just be the snake game. Yeah. Um, and if we think about that, that would actually end up being fairly, I don't want to say simple, but much simpler than it probably looks looking at all this code. Um, because the actual snake game, if you think about when you're playing it, the only real actions that can happen is the player can move up, down, left, or right, or the game can just proceed a step and have the snake move in whatever direction it's currently facing. So, you know, that's basically all the actions that your game state would have to take. So your API would be pretty, you know, bare, for, you know, the way people interact with it. But then internally, you could handle all those details and write tests for it and make sure everything's working. And you could even write tests to test the code of how the snake game works without ever touching any of the OpenGL stuff, which would make that a lot easier at that point. Um, we're not going to go into doing that refactor because it would be quite a bit of code change. Um, but it's something to think about whenever you're building something, you know, somewhat complex like this is how can I break this into pieces that are easier to test and, and manage? Because not only does it make it easier to test, but it also just makes it easier to approach as a developer without getting overwhelmed by this massive project that just seems impossible. Yeah. And the author's done a little bit of this. If you look at the snake module, there's, there's, you know, some attempt to do some separation of concern here, which I think is a really great start. So the author was thinking about these things. Maybe you didn't take it as far as potentially both of us would, but I, I think there's some, there's some definitely some evidence that they were already thinking about this way. So um, it's great to see. And I think what, even just seeing what the author has done, you can start to see how valuable that would be. Like there's a snake function and on that snake struct, you call move. That's really powerful. That's so clear to me what it's trying to do and what the intention of the function is, which, you know, um, there's a famous saying, which is code is read more than it's written, right? Like you, you write it once and then you read it lots and lots of times by lots and lots of different people. And so I think prioritizing that is really, really important and helpful. And the snake module, um, the name I'd probably rethink a little bit, just it's not particularly dramatic to use like module at the end. I think I would just call the package snake, to be honest. Um, but as long as it's clear to you and the folks working on it, that's fine. Um, I think this this is a really good sort of module. And it's very, very clear what a lot of the functions do, like snake.eat, like super helpful, clear, very clear to me what it's in, intended to do. So there's some really good evidence of, of the author thinking about some of these things. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I will say that they definitely had a good start with it. Um, but even if you look at some of the code, it's, I think this is something that's easy to do, especially early on when you're not used to separating everything. Um, things like horizontal move is a global variable inside of the main package. Yeah. And that controls the direction of the snake. So like, that's something that could be inside of the snake, but I, I'm guessing again, that the reason that this didn't happen was because they needed this key input callback function on line 222 of main .co. Um, they needed that function to have access to the snake's current direction. Um, which is possible with a struct. You would just need to basically create a closure that has access to the object so that it can modify it and do whatever it needs to, um, which would make the code a little bit different. Um, obviously, I haven't written it, so I don't know how much trouble that would be with the OpenGL packages, but I assume it would be possible in some way. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting thing to call out as well is, you know, John and I obviously have these views, and if this was on GitHub and we were writing pull requests, like these would be questions we'd ask, right? Like, why did you think about doing this? Did you think about this way? And, and the author may have a, a really great reason why not to. Um, and I, I think that's a really important thing to call about call out about code review and pull requests. Like, it should be a conversation. Like, the, the author of the code had very clear intention and ideas and thoughts. Um, it's a learning opportunity, but also there may be some really valid reasons about why those things happen. So, um, you know, always try and be open-minded when you read other people's codes and, and, and try and put yourself in their shoes and think about why they did what they did. Um, and it usually yields the best outcome, I think, because there's a balance. You want to, you want the best possible code to go into production, but you also want to be pragmatic about the needs of customers, of the business, of of, of that developer at the time. And uh, I just think these are important things to come, keep in mind. Yeah, I think that's that's something people forget whenever they look at a legacy code base and they're like, oh, we should just rewrite this whole thing. Is that they they forget that a lot of the code they're looking at that they don't like. There was probably a lot of reasons that led to it being designed the way it was. And when you go to rewrite, you might not realize them until you're three-fourths the way through your rewrite that, oh, our code's starting to look just as bad as that original code because there's a lot of weird things you have to take care of. Um, so sometimes code just happens to get ugly because there's not really a better way to do a lot of things. Or you know, maybe the way that you would act, the other ways to handle it are just not worth the extra, extra effort. Yeah, totally. <laughs> One thing I wanted to get your opinion on, John, because I think I have potentially a slightly different view to some folks on this is... Uh, this function here, so um, in this load progress function, 
the authors decided when if you can't load progress, uh, they, they will panic. Um, so panic's a, a controversial keyword in Go, I think. And I, I have quite a hard, hard line view. Most folks don't agree with that. You should almost never use it. Um, but if we put that to one side and think about the specific use case, like what do you think of the the use of panic here? Do you think this is appropriate or do you think we should return an error? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I think it depends on how they're using this. So to give you an example, if they were to load progress right when the, when the application started up and at that point they were to uh, basically say if it can't you know, load the progress for some file or if this thing doesn't work and there's no way to fall back, then potentially a panic might make sense because you just don't want the code to start at that point. In this case, I don't know that that makes sense because for starters, if you go to load the progress and it doesn't read progress, you can just revert their level to level one. So there is a way to, like, there is a fallback for this. So I think it's one of those cases where, you know, if, if you can handle that error, you should definitely be returning errors. Um, I, I, I guess a different case than this that I would be a little bit uh, more likely to say a panic might be okay is um, when they're loading images. So I think that's in the image loader.go. So they have this load image function, and this one also panics if they can't uh, read the image and decode it. So assuming that they're only loading these images right when the code starts up, I could see the justification here for, hey, this function is only called when the program's starting up, and if these images don't load, we can't play the game. So we're just going to have it panic at that point. Um, now, again, this is something that if somebody says, hey, in our code base, we're going to return an error instead, and you know, the main function needs to panic or whatever it's going to do at that point, um, log, you know, log a fatal error or whatever it's going to do. Um, I think that's fine too. I just know that there's definitely been cases where I know for sure that's the only way this function is being used. Um, so I will go ahead and do that. Now, I, I should, like, I don't know. It's it's kind of like a, it's definitely a balancing act because I could see cases where somebody, if you have a team that you're bringing on new developers and they don't quite understand those differences, you could easily run into a case where they panic when they shouldn't. Um, and by returning the error, really all you end up doing is you end up making it so that inside of the main.go function where they call, let me see if I can find load image or is it load texture? I think uh, it's load texture. Load texture is a look. Yeah, it's, it's oh. on line 81. Okay, so I guess that graphics.load texture calls the load image function. The texture calls. Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah, it does help us that load image up. Okay, so yeah, so so knowing that that's happening, um, and it, where it's happening, I don't think it's terrible that that particular function is is throwing a panic, but the downside to this one is that that it's not really clear that that function should only be called at startup, so I probably wouldn't have named it load texture. I'd probably have named it like must load texture, and I would have a separate function called load texture that returns an error, so that that way it's very clear when somebody calls this function, hey, there's two different ones. If you want an error back and it's not a case where you want to panic. You don't have to try to, you know, do a, a you know, basically catch that panic and, and recover. Um, but you know, that that would be the one thing I would probably change there is I, I wouldn't just have a function called load texture and do it. Yeah, um, that's really and, good. And you things. and I, sorry, you and I talked about this I think on Twitter. Um, with generics, I also don't know how useful it is to provide a must function anymore. Um, and for anybody wondering why I say that or what I mean, um, traditionally what would happen with a must function is that you would have some sort of function that returns one, it's usually one type. So it's going to return like a regular expression. Once it's compiled, it's going to return that regular expression, or it might have a template that you're compiling. So it'll return that template. Um, or it'll just be a function that, you know, it, it's basically checking to see if there's an error. And if there is an error, it's going to panic. Otherwise it's going to return the initial thing that you were passing in. Um, because generics were added to go, you can actually write a generic version of the must function, which I will, I have a link to one. I'll get it and add it to this video later when we're editing it. But basically you can write a single function with generics that takes in, the first argument is some generic type. The second argument is an error. And essentially what you're saying is, if that error is not nil, then I want you to panic. Otherwise return that initial first object you passed in. So there's not really a, as much of a reason for you know, libraries to provide that must function anymore, just because it's, it's not, it's not something where you have to write it for every single type you're passing in. Yeah, I think that's true. I've put three examples on my screen here, functions that do similar things that are from the standard library. So this, uh, to John's point, there's this template.must, and it does exactly what John says. Like you try and 
Uh, must is a tuple that wraps a call to a function returning template and error, and it panics if the error is non-nil. So if you do template.must, it basically just tries to load, and if um, if it if it uh, errors, it just panics straight away. So you don't have to deal with it. And you'll see that a lot in especially older libraries, and uh, I think Prometheus has a must register function as well. So you see you see quite a lot of the the must keyword. If you see a function that says dot must something, it's probably going to panic if it doesn't do exactly as as you want it to. So you should use caution cautiously. But then there's also functions like um, I think it's this template that parse files is the equivalent one, uh, which just returns a it tries to parse a template and if not it returns an error. So if I was to use this template dot must, I can depend on the program panicking if uh, if my template's not valid. Whereas this template dot parse files, I suppose technically there's a world where um, an engineer who's maybe not so familiar with Go or something like that maybe they underscore the error, for example, and therefore my program could continue execution without me ever realizing that it failed. And I'll discover it much later on when I try and probably uh, do T dot something and I realize it's nil and I get my, my program explodes in an uncontrollable fashion rather than exploding in a controllable fashion earlier. So I'm kind of, a, I, I hold the view that generally you probably shouldn't use panics really ever because I, I tend to try and put things as close to the main.go as possible. Anything that's going to be a explosion, I try and do in main.go, but I, I totally understand other people's point of views as well about if you really can't recover from that instance, like why why not panic? Um, it's kind of signaling to the to the user that you can't really recover from this, so we're get, we're going to take care of it for you. But I think we're both agreed that in this instance, probably loading function and um, which I think if I look at this load progress, it's called in this if load level. It calls load pep progress. I think what I would probably do here is return an error, uh, and then maybe if the error is could not load, um, I would show a short message to the user saying I couldn't load your progress, so I'm starting a new game and do that instead because I think that's an appropriate uh, action to take here versus a panic, which is probably going to kill the program completely. Yeah, that, that load progress is definitely one that I think should return an error because, like you said, it's being called multiple times within the program, and the game can start without that working, and it's also you can recover from that error. So there's like a bunch of reasons why that one doesn't necessarily make sense to panic, whereas um, I, I pulled up on my screen. Um, if, if you look at the regex package, they have what like must compile and must compile POSIX and like they have a, they have a couple different must functions there. Um, they write them a little bit different. So basically the way they do it is they'll, they'll basically have two functions. They'll have the compile function and they'll have the must compile function and must compile literally just wraps the, the compile function with that logic of checking for an error. Whereas the template package does it slightly differently. They provide a single must function that takes that, you know, in this case, it's a regular expression as the first argument. Um, and it would take an error as the second argument, and then it would just return the regular expression if there's no error. So you can see both of those approaches being used in different libraries. Um, the generics version would basically just be the same as the way the template package does it, except that first argument is generic. So because that exists, I think it's a better option to leave that you know leave that up to the developer to do at this point now that we have generics. And um, and I should also add that like whenever I'm saying, hey, I'm fine with a panic of some sort, um, generally in my mind, it needs to happen basically in the main function or rate, like if your main function calls a run function or something, maybe there. Um, but, you know, right inside of the main package, whenever you're setting up the game or setting up the program, I think it's, that's the, the, where I sort of have exceptions. So another example for this would be like, if you're setting up a web server that returns HTML pages and you use templates, um, if you decide that you're going to parse a template and it doesn't exist and your application cannot run without that template, I think it's okay at that point for your main function to just say, hey, we're going to panic and, and fail starting up at this point because there's no reason to proceed. But whenever you have something that, let's say you were parsing your templates when the user actually hits an endpoint, not at the start of your program, that's not a time to panic. Um, at that point, you should be returning an error and you should be rendering some sort of page to the user that's like, hey, we couldn't render the template for this page or we couldn't render this page for some reason. Um, you know, So it is very different. And I, I, I understand why a lot of code bases wouldn't want them because, as I said before, it's it's easier, especially for a junior developer, to not understand those how those two are different. And they might see must compile for regex, or they might see something else being used in other code, and then they might use it in their code in a different spot that's not really appropriate, thinking, oh, this is fine. And in reality, it's not. It could lead to some really hard to, to manage bugs and things like that that are just, you know, it's hard for your program to recover from. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good summary, to be fair. And I think that kind of matches, matches my view, too. Um, there was another thing I wanted your, to get your view on. Is there, is there any other piece of the code you wanted to call out? Uh, I think there was a couple that you would 
you go ahead. Uh, there was one that you had mentioned that I think I understand what they were trying to do, but I'm not sure if it's what you plan on bringing up. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to get your view on was, um, so I think I've already mentioned, I, I quite like the snake module. I think it's a step in the right direction. But one of the things I thought uh, caught my eye was the use of uh, pointer receivers. And I wondered, like, what's your, what's your view on using like pointer versus value receivers in this one? Do you think that was a good choice? Um, do you think we could sort them to value? Like, what's your thoughts? Um, I mean, there's definitely a couple cases where they're modifying the snake. So I think that's why they used a pointer. Um, I kind of have mixed feelings at times. It, it really depends on what I'm doing. I do like that once they realized they needed a pointer or you know, if they decided they needed one, they're consistent here throughout the code. Like all the functions are pointer receivers. And I think that's very important to make sure you're consistent. I will also say that I've had like beginners to the language ask me, you know, when do I know to use a pointer versus not a pointer? And you can try to tell them the general, like, well, if you need to um, modify something in that struct, then you need to have a pointer. You should generally probably be using a pointer. The only other option is I'm thinking about like set front is an interesting one because I don't, you don't necessarily need a function for that if you just exported that field and just let somebody set it. Yeah, that's true. It's very, uh, very Java I think, to have like setters yeah. and getters like this at times. Yeah. I think that comes from people not wanting to like, ex basically, they don't want to expose things. But I, in this case, I don't really know that that really is necessary. Um, so there, but let's say that you, trying to look at the rest of this. I, I guess I don't know. Um, looking at this, it looks like there's a couple cases where they actually modify the snake object, so I understand why they used a pointer, and I think that's fine. Um, and I'll, I'll say that if I was writing this and I didn't really know if this could be a pointer or not, and I was thinking that might be the case down the road, I would probably just opt to use a pointer receiver because I know the pointer receiver is going to work. Whereas if you start with a non-pointer receiver and then down the road you decide, hey, I need to be able to modify this, it's a little bit more annoying to go back and basically refactor all the code so that it is a pointer receiver and all the you know, all the methods that it has and that it's used as a pointer throughout the rest of the code like appropriately. Yeah, so I think that what makes was your opinion sense. here? Exactly the same as yours, to be honest. I think um, a lot of people sort of fear, I think, pointer receivers. I, th I think there probably is a way to write this without using them. But I also think the snake has state and we want to modify that state. And this, as you say, there's a couple of places it happens. So when I first looked at this, I was kind of getting ready to get out my, oh, this should probably be a value receiver sort of feedback. Um, but when I dug into it a little bit more, I was like, no, it doesn't make sense. That, it actually makes sense here. I think the snake should have state. We've got this body, which gets appended to, um, which I think is a reasonable thing to do. You could maybe move that to game state if you wanted to, rather than the snake owning it. But I think the snake owning its, its length is also um, a really good call. Um, I generally start programs with value receivers um, if I if I can, just because... I try to discourage folks from modifying uh, structs just because I tend to find it leads to more mistakes, um, not particularly for any other reason than that. There's there's tons of people who try and argue that uh, using pointer receivers is uh, is more efficient for large structs, but I haven't seen too much evidence of this in in my time. To be honest, I've never I've never so solved a performance issue by switching it, but there may be folks out there who have. Um, and to your point about consistency, I think that's super important too. So I think I've done a really good job with it here. Yeah, I'll definitely say that if the reason you're using a pointer is for memory efficiency or speed or something along those lines, I don't think that's a good enough reason to use a pointer receiver unless you're in one of those very specific use cases where it's been proven to be like necessary or very useful. Because um, that just feels like a very early optimization that's not necessary and could lead to all sorts of confusion and issues when it doesn't need to be there. Um, and I'll say that in the case of the snake, one of the ways I could see it potentially not being a pointer receiver was if you opted to represent the game state as a struct, and then instead of modifying that struct, if you opted to write a bunch of functions that take in a game state and return a new game state so that you mm. can like keep track of history, essentially. Um, and if you were doing that, then I think at that point, it makes sense to not have a snake pointer inside of that, but instead have a snake that gets copied to the next one and has the modifications applied to the new one. Um, so th there are definitely cases where it would make sense there. And the reason I say that is that if you have, if you're copying the game state over and over again for you know each step in history, and every one of them points to the same snake struct, the same pointer, at that point, you're not really going to have real history because the snake's not going to be copied throughout the game state. So it doesn't make sense there. But it, th that just basically comes back to like how you choose to represent the game and whether or not having that history is important. And in a lot of cases, it might not be, but you might be doing something where 
um, you know, it's cool for users to be able to step back in time and see what happened to their, you know, through their game and how they played it or whatever. So if you wanted like replays or something, that might be something that makes sense. Yeah, that could be really cool. And that, that's something always to think about as well, isn't it? Is even if uh, technically a feature might make sense or an approach makes sense, like think about you've just enabled two features that are possible in the future because of the way you've approached this. And, you know, say, say, say this is a real product and we're releasing it and the product manager goes, oh, I want an undo button. It's 99 cents to do an undo. And, you know, with the approach of copying game state, it's just become trivial to implement that. Whereas this would need a complete re-architecture. So I think sometimes it's, it's really cool to think about what things could become. Obviously, you don't obsess over it and massively over-engineer because of it. But especially if you're working in an enterprise environment, like understanding the end game for your service, your domain can be really useful to think about those decisions. And you might still choose to make a decision to do it this way because it's faster for now. But, um, you know, if it's not too much work to to keep a history or something like that, you know, you've now enabled two features very, very quickly that could be really, really cool to add. And I think that's a, it's a really interesting thing to to think about when you're developing software. Yeah. So I we talked about the helpers package not really being an idiomatic package name, correct? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, we could talk about it a bit, a bit more. Mm -hmm. so I think we talked about snake module, um, but I don't know if we can call that helpers specifically. Okay. So generally when you see people writing code, um, I, I get it for what's going on in this code, but a lot of times having a package called helpers is not really idiomatic Go code because it doesn't really describe what that package is for. And what tends to happen is you just have a package that has a bunch of random functions thrown in there where people don't really think about where they should go. They just throw them in there because anything fits in that. Um, so we talked about sort of separating the logic of the game where I said I would take it even farther and have the actual snake game is its own um, package or its own struct type that sort of contains all that logic with methods or what you know functions that use that type, whatever, however you want to implement that. Um, I think if you started separating things a little bit more that way, it would become a little bit clearer where some of these functions should go. But at the moment, um, you know, the way everything's set up, I get why it doesn't look that way. Uh, an example of this is like this load image function that's inside of here. I don't actually know that that function needs to be in a helpers fa package. I think that function could probably just be inside of the graphics package. Um, because I believe the graphics package is the only thing that uses it. And I don't see any reason to put that anywhere else, essentially. Unless the author was thinking, oh, I might write other things down the road that need this. But uh, to me, that just seems like something that would just be in the graphics package. Yeah, it's a really good call out because I, I just clicked on the usage of the load image and it's literally only used once in the load texture function inside the graphics package. So it could it could even it could be a private function probably inside that package, to be honest, and it wouldn't break the code. Yeah. Especially because I think when you're new, you you export a lot of functions for various reasons, but it, whenever you're actually designing some sort of API, like the graphics package, let's say that was going to be your API for interacting with OpenGL. Um Having less functions exposed, in my opinion, makes it a lot easier to maintain because you can change whatever you want to down the road. Um, you don't have to worry so much about, oh, somebody happens to call this load image function, and now if I want to change it to make my use cases easier, I can't because I might break their code. Whereas if it was a private function inside of there, it's not something that um, you know, anybody else has access to, so you don't have to worry about you know, what changes you make to it. Yeah. And then um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was, I think you had made a note, or the last thing I can think of right now, you had made a note in the um, graphics package about all the constants that they had. Yes. Uh, this was, yeah, graphics.go. There's a, At the top here, there's a bunch of, uh, I think it's every key press defined as a constant. I don't, yeah, I was going to say, it, at first I was wondering if it was just the ones that they used, but there's a bunch there that I don't think they're using at all, so... I don't know why those are there specifically. Um, and this this is just me guessing, looking at this code. I think what they were doing was they were trying to wrap it so that inside of like the main.go where you're rendering graphics, that package doesn't have to actually implement or import the OpenGL packages. It can just call the graphics package and any key presses that it needs to use are, are declared there and it can use them without having to like know how the graphics package is actually implemented. I, th I think that was kind of the reasoning there. Um, but in this particular code base, it ends up not and or it ends up just not panning out that way, where inside of main.go, it still imports the the GLFW package and the uh, math GL package. So because it's already importing those, it's already writing code that's very specific to the open GL stuff, I would assume. Maybe I'm wrong, but it looks like it's going to be pretty specific to that. 
So at that point, I'm not sure how much wrapping that OpenGL stuff inside of the graphics package and doing all those constants really helps you. Um, you could probably get away with just calling the glfw.key1.key2, whatever other stuff there is. Yeah, I think that makes sense. There was uh, there was two couple more things I, I wanted to call out. One was in um, let me take a quick look at my notes. I think it was in the snake module. Uh, there's this function called uh, init snake. Um, I just wanted to call. It, I, I like this a lot. Um, I think that they they basically provided a function to. It takes snake length and um, I think that's effectively a midpoint, right? And then it just oh like how close you need to be to be a hit. And it returns a, a a sensible default of a snake, let's say. So instead of folks having to remember that they need to do it, like something like um, s equals snake, and then having to figure out what all of these things mean, you can just pass a minimal set of things, and it gives you a, a snake that will work for you. And I think that's a really nice little um, thing to do for folks. Uh, I'd probably take this one step further personally, and I would probably make snake length. And maybe even the intersectional threshold optional, and make a function called init snake that doesn't take anything. And maybe you could add um, either functional options or a configuration struct that lets you set those things if you want. But I think we can give a sensible default of those things, which would make it make it even easier for folks to uh, initialize new snakes in the future. So I, I quite like using that as a pattern when when I'm doing stuff like this. Yeah, and one of the idioms of Go is to like make the zero value useful. But it's worth noting that in cases like the snake, sometimes it's a lot of effort to make it so that a zero value snake is actually useful in the game. Um, and having a function that declares it and sets it up correctly is often the better choice for a lot of things. It it really depends on the context for that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the intersection threshold, if I recall correctly, when I looked over the code, I think the reason that that's there is because they're, they're kind of trying to figure out if the snake is close enough to a, a smiley face image that it, you know, the food essentially that it's going to eat. Um, Whereas when I talked about breaking up the logic of the game, realistically, snake can be just thought of as like a, a grid of, you know, like integer like spots on an XY grid of like zero, 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 one. Um, so you don't actually need an intersection threshold for, you know, to actually play the snake game because you're moving like by tiles. You're not actually like moving like you would in like an FPS where there's a million, you know, spots in between each, each different location. So if they were to break that up a little bit further, that would actually make it so that things like the intersection threshold don't need to be there. Um, and instead, it just comes down to like keeping track of the snake game in some state. And you could potentially add all sorts of options like changing the width of the game, changing um, you know, the default starting length of the snake, there, you know, all sorts of stuff to, to dictate whether or not you win the game, if the snake's a certain length or, or whatever those rules are, um, which is why I think that's just a, a nice approach to take for that stuff. Yeah. Um, cool. I think that's most of the stuff. Um, and I should mention that if I was doing, I haven't done the refactor. Maybe at some point I'll find the time to do it. But if I was doing that refactor where I brought all the snake logic separately, um, I, I think I would also need to have a package that is completely dedicated to just taking a current game state and rendering it on the UI. Like if, if you had a package that, or, you know, at least a function that was designed around doing that, that's how you would get around that. The, the sense of like having the two separately is that you would then have graphics code that is completely dedicated to just rendering a specific state. And then you could write your game engine to basically intermingle between those two and to translate, oh, the user hit a on their keyboard. I need to translate that to a move left action inside of the game state. So there it, it's arguably more code potentially. Um, but that separation should make that a lot easier to work with down the road. Yeah, it could also mean that, and I, I'm, this is complete conjecture here, but I think, you know, like if you think about games when they get um, released by multiple platforms and some of those platforms do use a different game engine, I imagine this is somewhat how they achieve that, a much more complex uh, layer. But the fact that you have like a game engine on top, but then you have like the business logic underneath and they two kind of communicate means that you can probably migrate or upgrade your game engine or move between them. I'm not going to say with minimal effort because I imagine it's incredibly difficult, but with less effort than if it was all smashed together into a single thing. Yeah, I think um, even like older games, I think I think it was Tetris was the one I was watching a video on where Tetris like eventually breaks at a certain level. And for the longest time, people didn't know that because you had to get really far into the game for it to happen. And it got to speeds that people just couldn't play at. 
But when you get to a certain point, there's like a random chance that goes, it goes up pretty high later on that, um, that the game will break. And the reason it breaks is that you have two different processes going on. One that's rendering the screen. So this happens like every time, you know, like if it's like 24 FPS, every like one or you know, basically every, every what one 24th of a second, um, it would just, it would happen. So it would have the, the the part of the code that's used to render the screen, and then it'd have the game logic that's calculating things like what the current score is um, and different stuff like that. And those two are sort of separately, and the, the rendering part would actually just take the state that it has and would render it on the screen, and then it would hand off the process to the, the game logic part that would do things like calculating score and doing everything else it needs to. And what eventually caused that bug in the Tetris game, for anybody who cares, I guess, is that the way they did the, the calculations of score and everything just got to the point where it was too slow, and eventually the the game logic would not be able to write whatever it needed to to resume inside of memory so that whenever the graphics took over, it would go back to the game logic and it would not know where to start. And it would essentially just grab the next address and the, uh, you know, stored in the uh, stack or wherever it was, and it wouldn't be a valid location. So the game would crash. But it was one of those things where like even games that old would use some process like that, where the, the two are kind of separate and there's one part that's responsible for rendering the screen and another part that's responsible for handling a lot, a lot of that game logic and you know, calculations. That's really cool. I, I, my friend actually recommended me, there's a film about the creation of Tetris and uh, folks fighting over it for the rights of it and stuff, which he said was really excellent. It's not, not the first thing I think to watch a movie about, but apparently it's really, really good. So uh, you all should add that. I haven't watched list. it, but I, I had the same thoughts as you. I was like, this seems to have good reviews, so I want to watch it, but it seems like a very, like the pitch for that had to have sounded super boring. Like, you want a movie <laughs> about Tetris? Yeah, I must admit, I agree. I, um, I can't say much though, because I, I literally watched a YouTube video that explained like Tetris speed running and, and how it led to the bugs and stuff like that. So <laughs> like, I think I find some of that interesting because you're looking at how people wrote code, especially on very limited systems. Um, and, and that's, you know, we talked about the context of this, of this was a learning project. So the expectation for there to necessarily be a bunch of tests and 100% code coverage is, is not realistic at all for something where somebody's just trying to get it running, test it out, and learn some things as they go. Uh, you know, if you're trying to learn tests or you want to do those things, then that makes complete sense. But if that's not your goal, I understand why you wouldn't have tests. But then you look at like games and the Tetris, you know, like the Nintendo stuff, like I was saying, a lot of times the context there is that they have very limited memory or they, you know, they have some constraints that force them to write code in a very unique way. And I think that's really interesting to look at is to understand the context that people are writing code in and how they dealt with that. Totally. Cool. So there's two two final thoughts I have for this project, which are absolutely nothing to do with the, the code, actually. I just wanted to call out quickly, um, as there are the other things I would typically check when doing a review as well. Um, so the first one was, uh, there's no readme. Again, this this person didn't author this project for it to be shared widely on the internet or anything like that, so I totally get why um, they didn't add one. And actually, this this program was exceptionally well written that I literally just, you, you saw me just hit run and it, and it worked, which is amazing. But typically when I write projects, um, especially if you do want it to, if you're going to collaborate with folks on it, or even if it's just a reminder to, to future Matt, I'll tend to leave a small note in the readme of things I was thinking about, uh, things that were hard, um, ex exactly how to get it running, maybe some dependencies um, that you may need to install to get it running. So I think that would be a piece of feedback I'd give to anyone who's creating a repo, especially if they want contributions from others, is even a minimal readme goes a long way. Um, it's very easy. It's, it's kind of funny at times when you see some of these code bases that people have put thousands of hours into and then they put 20 minutes into the readme. And I think it's, it, it can be a detractor from people contributing to your project. Um, so it's definitely worth spending a little bit of time to, to just fill in the, the bare minimum of stuff you need to get going and to contribute to a project if that is your goal. Yeah. I would also add there that I found myself in the situation where when I forget to add a readme that has like a lot of times my readme, if there's nothing else in it, it'll just have a list of commands. And it's like, I can look at the readme and if I see go run main.go, I'm like, okay, that's going to be how I just run the program. And if it has a couple other go run some commands or something, I'm like, okay, I know those things are there as options. I can go look at them and figure out what's going on. But if I don't have that, I'll come back to a project that maybe I haven't looked at for six months for some reason. And it takes a little bit of time, way more than it should take to figure out how do I run this again? Like what was the entry point and do I need to do anything else? Like, do I need to start up another server or have a database or what do I need? So having that in a readme goes a long way, even for yourself down the road, if you're not planning on sharing it. Yeah, especially if it's a side project or a personal project. And 
maybe you've only got 30 minutes or an hour and you're super excited to try and add some feature, but then you spend 20 to 30 minutes of that just getting yourself set up. Like it can be the reason you don't come back to a project, at least in my experience. Uh, and then the final thing I wanted to, sorry, we you going to say something else? No, no I was going to agree, but you're good. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to call out, which is a super boring thing, but um, was the go module file here. So um, a couple of things. And and if you were not sharing this project with others, they're, they're really less of a concern. But the first one is the module name. So uh, module names have to be unique for people to be able to pull it and to do go install and go get and whatnot. Um, so we've kind of landed as a, as a go community on using like github.com slash username slash go module. Usually it's the same as the repo name. So uh, the module might need to be changed here to allow the folks to pull it. I'm actually really intrigued about what would happen if I did go get this. Um, <laughs> I don't think it would work. So I don't know if it would be able to. Kind it wouldn't of know where to get it, it, I don't think. Yeah. And it's kind of depending on those things. But uh, it's been so long since I've seen a module that wasn't github.com slash something slash whatever. that I, I actually was like, I had to pause to think what would happen in this instance. But um, yeah, good practice is to call it the, the location of where you're going to find it. Do you want to go ahead and just like write that in there? So like type it up so they see what you mean? Yeah. So it'd be github.com uh, slash, uh, I can't remember the username, sorry. So I'm just going to put in uh, mine for now, just because I do know that. Uh, so this is what a, a go module name might look like. And you'll see all my repos follow this sort of pattern. Um, if you use this, when people go go get, once you push this to GitHub, if someone goes go get github.com slash Matt James Wells slash snake game, it would, it would uh, be able to pull it into their projects as a dependency. And you can actually see an example of this below. So uh, the Go team are very, they have the uh, the, dom the domain name golang.org. And then they have this package, which is slash x slash, slash image. So this, uh, when I do golang.org, uh, so the Go module name for that will be golang.org slash x. And then the image is a package within there that I can pull in. Yeah, I think talking about vanity URLs and your package names is a whole nother topic. Um, People, I, I definitely know some people have mixed feelings about them as to whether or not you should be doing them or not. Uh, but but it is nice, like when you have that github.com, like Matt said, you can go get it. But on top of that, I really love that if you happen to be looking at the code, you can easily see where like you know, where the code is stored online. So if you wanted to go read, if there's, you know, look for documentation, look for issues, look for things like that, you know where to look at for, for all those things. Um, but again, like Matt said, this was a small project that was probably not intended to be go get by anybody. So... I understand why they did snake game, but totally. I, that, that's one of those ones you probably just want to get into the habit of always using github.com slash, you know, your username slash whatever the package is. Yeah. And then the final thing in here is you can probably see some squiggly lines. And this is, a, I think, a relatively new feature of Goland, but it's very, very helpful um, in that if I hover over these uh, modules, it's going to say, hey, there's a newer version available of this one. Uh, same for this one, there's a newer version available. And then for this one, it's actually going to tell me that there's a security issue with this this version. So this is really cool. So um, generally, it's a good idea to keep your your Go modules up to date. And when you get feedback like this, it might be a good idea to make sure you update them and keep yourself updated, especially if you're going to be running this uh, in production with different users and stuff like that. Just make sure you've got the, the latest and greatest in a process to be able to update your Go modules. Uh, you could use Dependabot if you use GitHub, or you can use Renovate. It can also help you out with some of this stuff. It'll make pull requests on your behalf. Dependency management is really boring, but it's also really important. So I thought it was worth uh, at least a call out um, and the other thing in the same similar sort of aim was the Go version. So I think this was published a few years back. So definitely don't definitely understand why they're using Go one seventeen. Um, probably a good idea to consider whether you want to upgrade this to. There's actually some of the code in the repo that I spotted that could be improved or changed if they kind of move to a newer version of Go. I think John already turned uh, called that about generics and how they might be able to help for some of the functions here. Um, and there's also some random number generation, which can be simplified in newer versions of Go as well. So uh, it's always worth trying to keep semi up to date on what, what the latest and greatest Go version is, because you might get some some nice features that make your application faster and also make it more secure and also mean that you can uh, simplify your code a little bit too. So I do have one question for you regarding that one. How do you try to balance, if if, if you have a library, which this isn't, but let's say you have a library, how do you try to balance the like, because I believe that's the minimum version required in order to use this package at that point. Yeah. So in that case, in this case, since it's like a program that runs, it makes sense to just use the most recent version as long as you can, um, because you're not going to you know affect anybody who's importing your code because they're not importing it. But if you were to start bumping that, um, how do you sort of balance that? Like, oh, we could just stay at this version and keep working and everybody can keep getting updates versus the minute we bump this Go version, 
you know, essentially we're locking out any old code that might be using it. Yeah, it's a really good call out. We, we struggle with this at Cloudflow a little bit, to be honest. Our team owns a bunch of libraries and uh, we, we tend to try and stick to the minimal version we need to be able to keep it running. Um, but one thing that we also do is we aggressively try to have zero dependencies on a lot of our libraries, um, which helps somewhat with this discussion because uh, unless there's a major security issue in Go itself, uh, or we, we tend to be pretty comfortable with the fact that, um, you know, we may be running a, it may be available to folks who are like a couple of Go versions behind, but we generally encourage teams to upgrade as soon as possible. Um, and we'll only add, uh, so the, the last major thing I remember is uh, Go 113 added, added errors.is and errors.as. And like, that was such a big <laughs> quality of life improvement. I know we made, we did go around and upgrade a bunch of our libraries at that point to, to be able to use that because it's just, it was just clearer and easier to see how things were working. Even though I, I, you could argue it certainly wasn't necessary and it's probably speeding some libraries updated now, I imagine to, to use generics in some points, which obviously would mean that you'd have to use Go 121, but hopefully it value to the user. It's definitely a tough balance. Um, and sometimes you'll get it dictated for you. Like for example, say this math. GL library, we need to upgrade that because it's got a security defect in it, but they've upgraded to 121 to solve it. That means we'll have to do it as well. So I think, um, I don't think there's any perfect answer, but I think trying to uh, keep, the, if you keep your libraries close to zero dependencies as possible, you'll make your life a little bit easier. Um, but I understand there's probably tons of situations where that, that's just simply not possible. Um, I think that's it for this code review then. Uh, I do want to say thank you to Dimitri for sending us your code. Um, hopefully it was clear that we weren't trying to like say your code was bad or roasted or anything along those lines. We we very much were just trying to find some code that we could walk through and talk about some different things to think about and contemplate on. Um, I know that we didn't refactor all this code. Again, it was, it was a bit much to refactor it all, write it all out. But hopefully these you know tips and, and advice we talked about would help you think about ways to refactor your code. Yeah, it was a really great project. Thank you so much for sharing it with us and for giving us this opportunity to go through it. It was really nice to see something uh, a little bit different. I've never tried to write a game in Go, and I think this was a really fun project, uh, hopefully for you to create and for us to look at. And I, I really hope, I, I'm, I, I think it's great that you built something that worked and you shipped it and you shared it, and that's amazing. And that's what everyone should aim to do. So, you know, if it comes down to following any of the advice we've given and building something that's fun and shipping it, you should ship it every time and don't worry about any of the things we said because it's best to get things out in the world. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was Mark Bates or Corey Lanou that told me the one time that basically whenever they do code reviews with each other, they'd always made the comment that writing the initial version is a lot harder than being the person who looks at it and tells you how to refactor it and clean it up. Like that initial version is a lot more effort. So, you know, it, it's not like we're trying to, 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 you know, say anything negative. We understand that writing the initial version for this code was very challenging. Um, and as a result, like coming back through and refactoring stuff is, is a lot easier because at that point you understand everything a lot better. You understand where to refactor stuff. And we get to skip all the hard work of figuring out like, how do we draw these graphics and like, how do we do all these different things? Um, we just get to look at the code and sort of talk about approaches and strategies that we might take to clean up the code or make it more maintainable down the road. And I, I, I do think it's worth mentioning that even when Matt and I write code, or Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't always write code in the way we're describing it in a code review. Um, a lot of times we write the, the cruder version first, and then once we have something roughed out, then we say, okay, how can I clean up this code? How can I make it better? And I don't think it's, you know, it's, it's definitely not something you should get beat yourself up about if you aren't writing that perfect code the first time, because pretty much nobody does. Yeah, I love it. Uh, throw up a pull request and I'll be the first person to review my own pull request and go, actually, I didn't do a good job here. And sometimes I'll, I'll have done the wrong thing and know it. And I'll leave a comment saying, I know this could be done better, but for X, Y, Z reason, I haven't done it this time. And it, it might be a time constraint. It might be we're waiting on another team and we need to ship that for now. It might just be pure laziness. And I'm trying to convince my team that it's a great idea to let me be lazy this time. Like there's tons of reasons that that's the case. So yeah, hundred percent, like we, we've given general sort of sweeping purist points of view at points here, but you know, you've always got to be pragmatic about these things. Our job is to solve customer problems to ship business value. And lots of the things we talked about here um, may not always be possible in the time window you have, and you've just got to, you've got to be pragmatic. And also this, the second you ship code, it becomes legacy code. You're going to learn something new tomorrow that maybe you could have used here. Um, and so it's, it's an ongoing process of maintaining things and just, you know, be, being honest about, uh, the fact that that's going to be the case and we're going to learn new things and things are going to change.
All right. Awesome. Thanks for uh, checking this out. Thanks, folks.